Hello, church. Thanks for joining us for our virtual church lobby on Church Online. Over the next 30 minutes, our host and pastoral team will be engaging with you on some key events coming up in the life of our church, on how your week has been going, and joining you in prayer. We hope that you've had a great week since we all worshiped together last. And if you've had a tough week, be sure to click on that request prayer button and one of our pastors will be sure to reach out to you. If you're currently watching on our YouTube page, we miss you and we'd love for you to come join us here in our virtual church lobby by visiting our church website and clicking the join us button. It's that simple for us to come together as one global church family today. Now, let's gather together as one church family and continue to connect and greet each other with some virtual high fives as we start our morning of worship together. My name is Miguel, and this is my story and the story of my people. I was born in Venezuela, and I love my country and my people, but my heart is heavy for them. Our economy, our healthcare system, our transportation system, everything that makes life possible lies in ruins all around us. Over 5 million of my fellow Venezuelans have been forced by hunger and desperation to leave their homes and communities and scattered to countries all over the world. Many millions more of us have made the equally difficult decision to stay. It was my heart desire to somehow help my people, to bring hope and change to our devastated country. I knew that the solution could not be found in politics. 
that we need something more effective than activism and more fulfilling than humanitarian aid. And so in answer to my prayer for my people, God led me to Ebenezer Bible Institute in San Cristobal. My prayer as I went to study was that God would equip me to bring back words of hope and salvation to my people. I knew it wouldn't be an easy calling. The local evangelical churches in Venezuela are small, underfunded, and were already bent low from the collapse of our social structure. But now with COVID, the burden has become even more challenging. The reality is that my people are struggling to feed themselves and their families. It's an old and true saying that you can preach to someone who has an empty stomach. The teachers at the Bible Institute understood this truth and saw the depths of our people's suffering. They knew that God hears the cries of His people and that Jesus' gospel brings hope and healing to the body as well. I went to study at the Institute expecting to learn the Bible, but my eyes were opened to understanding the life-giving Word of God like I have never understood it before. I have never noticed how often the Bible speaks of gardens and planting and growing and harvesting and feeding. All of these biblical themes took on a new and practical meaning for us and brought hope in a way that I never expected. Not only did we learn about God's love and plan for humanity throughout history, but along with these powerful theological truths, we learned how to prepare soil, fertilize, plant, irrigate, weed, cultivate and harvest. The vision is that each local church in Venezuela will also be a community hub for food security. The pastors serve meals to the hungry, but they also teach them how to plant their own gardens in order to feed themselves and their families. When people come to the church, we study the word together, we pray together, we eat together, but then we plant together and cultivate together and harvest together. There is such a change in the people as they see visible signs of God's provision in the green shoots coming up through the earth. To see my people working in their gardens, singing songs of praise to the Creator, praying thanksgiving to their Father. It's as if we were actually planting hope and harvesting joy. It's no wonder that Jesus often directed the attention of His disciples to the fields, to the seeds, to the vines and the trees. These gardens provide much-needed food, but they have also become symbols of hope to a desperate people. As I work in my garden now, the words of Paul to the church in Corinth make me smile. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. I declare this truth. You are God's field over each garden planted in the village I serve. God's provision for my people is so complete and so good. I have returned to my people not only as a pastor, but unexpectedly and providentially as a trained and equipped gardener.
to the throne of mercy where would I kneel but at this cross of grace how great the love how strong the hand that holds us beautiful so beautiful so here I bow to
hope that you got the chance to say hello to someone you know this morning. And if you're new, we hope you got to meet some truly awesome people. They're out there. As we get ready to enter into our live stream service this morning, we want to remind you of a couple things. If you're watching on YouTube right now and you want to engage in the chat and post service prayer, you can do so by visiting our church website and clicking the Join Us button. Secondly, our pastoral team will be on the chat for 30 minutes after service to engage with you further about the message, answer any questions you may have, and for an extended time of prayer. Just click the Request Prayer button to connect with someone today. Church, let's quiet our hearts as we focus in together on the Word of God in our songs of worship and our message this morning. Lord, we lift your name up as one global church family and thank you for your presence here as we worship together. Hey church, 
I'm Camilo, and it's so good to be with you again for our online worship service. We are so glad you are here to worship with us today. If you are new here, we want to extend a huge welcome to you. We are so thrilled that you are decided to spend this time with us, and we encourage you to engage in the ways you feel most comfortable. Our chat is a great way to connect, ask questions, and express in our worship throughout our time together. You can also learn more about who we are and ways you can get connected on our church website, thepeopleschurch.ca. At the end of the service today, our virtual church lobby will stay open for 30 minutes for you to engage further with today's message and for an extended time of prayer with our pastoral team. If you are a parent of kids under the age of 12, we hope that you had the opportunity to join in on today's kids' worship time on Zoom with other families, volunteers, and our TPC Kids team. They meet each week at 10 a.m. on Zoom. You can sign up to join them for worship on our church website. This summer, our kids will be taking part in our virtual VBS experience from July 12 to 16 and August 16 to 20. This is a great opportunity for your kids to engage with other kids in fun activities, Bible teachings, and songs. More information is available on our church website. Also, if you haven't had the chance to watch our age-appropriate kids' worship and teaching videos, you can find them after service on our kids' online playlist on our YouTube channel. Now, as we head into a time of worship to join our voices in songs of praise to our God, let's prepare our hearts in prayer for our time together. Heavenly Father, we are united as a one big church in many different locations, but uh, guided by your Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, for the technology, uh, for the ways that we can get connected and, 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 and we can bring our hearts to you in different places. Please, God, uh, lead us in this time of worship and teaching and that your seed that you are bringing in our hearts can grow and, get, and give a good fruit. We praise this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, church. So good to be with you again. I want to read for us um, from the scriptures. This is Psalm 100, and I'm reading out of the uh, Tony Evans Study Bible. This is the CSB version. This is a familiar psalm to many of us. It says, Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. And I have a note here in my Bible that I want to read for you. It says, the Lord is God is a translation of the Hebrew phrase, Yahweh is Elohim. Yahweh is the name of God revealed in his covenant relationship with his people. And Elohim speaks of power. He is the one who created the heavens and the earth. Thus, the powerful God wants a relationship with you and should be given recognition. So when it says in verse 3, acknowledge that the Lord is God, that's what that scripture means. It goes on to say, he made us and we are his, his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is what? He is good. The Lord is good. And his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. There's one other note here. It says, in the Bible, people are to engage in worship with a sense of excitement. Are you coming with excitement today, church? You can't worship the Lord without your emotions. It is no mere intellectual exercise. Worship is all that we are responding to all that he is. I love that idea. Worship is all that we are responding to all that he is. He is good. He is greatly to be praised. So would you stand to your feet if you're able, church? Lift your hands. Lift your voices with us. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. Bring your worship to him today. Come on. You, Lord, you are worthy. And no one can worship you for me. For all of the things you've 
done for me no one can worship you for me here is my worship here is my worship all of my worship receive my worship all of my worship sing that again you lord thanksgiving in his courts with praise today church he is faithful through every generation scripture reminds us of that how has God been faithful to you are there things that he has done in your life surely there are that you can give him thanks for today as we're continuing to worship him today take this moment and worship him thanking him for all he's done for you I am breathing I 
hands together, dance, sing, all unto the Lord. Come on. All we see, every wonder was assembled by His hand. What compares to His power, to the greatness He God, creator of all things, this world that we live in is yours. It is designed to bring you glory, and every one of us that inhabits it was designed to bring you glory, it was designed to have relationship with you, to be one with you, to be one with each other. There was a way and a plan that sin got in the way of and messed up. But Jesus was obedient to you, God the Father. 
Father, you sent your only son into this world to walk among us, to feel the things we feel, to experience the things that we experience as humans. But he was also fully God, even while he was fully man. And he did miraculous things while he was here. He showed a better way, a different way than what many had interpreted as being your way. And it was those who saw, understood, repented, and obeyed who created a legacy that lived on in your church. And we are your church today in this generation at this time in history. We didn't ask to be put here at this point in history. That's all part of your design. And we didn't ask for the abilities and gifts that you've given us. That's all part of your design. And so, Lord, as we wrestle with the issues of today, the issues in our own lives, and acknowledge that you are sovereign and that you have a plan. Lord, may you find us, your church, to be willing to be submitted to your way, to the truth, the life, and to be ready to do your will. Lord, we know that many are carrying burdens today. We all carry something. Some of us are good at hiding it and locking it away and putting on a good face. Others are really grappling with it and the wounds are open and raw and real right now. But you do not create this environment where we need to be perfect to come to you. You say, just come. Just come. You have healing in the name of Jesus for us today. You have provision in the name of Jesus for us today. You have wisdom, authority, power compassion, love, kindness in Jesus today. So God, we run to you. Our Father, our Creator, our Provider today.
Good morning, church. What's up? I'm Noelle, and it's so great to be worshiping with you today. What an awesome blessing it is being in community together. And we're going to continue our worship by giving because it's our consistent and generous giving that allows us to engage with our global partners who are continuing to do God's work all over the world. And it helps our global family experience Christ in new ways and grow as disciples of Jesus. So we give. We give cheerfully and faithfully to our Lord because not only are these gifts impacting our local church community, they continue to impact our global church family in some amazing ways. And if you would like to give, you can do so by texting the word people's give, all one word, to 77977. It's simple. It's secure. You can click the Give button now in the chat, or for more ways to give, you can visit the church website. Now, church, this past week, we asked you through our weekly email and our social networks that we come together as a global family to lift up our nation, its leaders, and essentially everybody who calls Canada home in prayer. And today, a part of our prayer, we're going to be taking a moment to acknowledge the precious life of every single Indigenous child lost through the residential school system. So please join with me as we pray together. Father, we humble ourselves and bow before your throne of grace, and we thank you for your loving presence where we can find rest and be still with a peaceful spirit. As we embrace these summer months, we are reminded of your faithfulness all throughout this past school year. Thank you for the gift of technology that allowed our children to learn and connect in a safe environment. Thank you for all of our teachers, parents, and everyone who contributed to the nurturing and growth of our kids. We ask that you would bless them in your love and help them to feel renewed and refreshed as they settle into summer. And Lord, we also want to take this time to remember each precious life, every single Indigenous child lost through the residential school system in Canada. You know each child by name. You know the truth of their stories. We pray for comfort and strength for the parents, the aunties, the uncles, the grandmas, the grandpas, left to grieve the empty places in their homes and their communities. Be with Indigenous communities in the constant pain they are experiencing through lives lost and lives tragically harmed. And we repent of the sins. We repent of the sins of the church in causing and perpetuating this pain for Indigenous peoples. Jesus, teach us to listen and give us the humility and courage to live differently with Indigenous peoples in Canada. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen church today we have the privilege of hearing from one of our own andre lewis has been a a part of our church family for many years now so please let's welcome him and open our eyes and our our hearts to what god is going to say through him today good morning church it's great to be with you again and live this time and i'm looking forward to the day where we'll be live and in person. So for today, I will be teaching from the third part in a three-part series from the book of Jonah on nationalism, racism, and the gospel. And I invite you to check out, after this message, the first two parts, if you haven't, on our TPC app or on YouTube. And so today, we're going to be taking a similar posture as we did earlier this week with Canada Day, and that's one of reflection. And so throughout this message, you're going to have opportunities and a time to reflect on the things that are being said and that you're hearing by the Spirit through the book of Jonah. And so get your Bibles ready and anything that you feel appropriate to take notes with. So now, as a recap, in the first two parts of the series, we essentially saw Jonah be disobedient to God's call to preach to the foreign city of Nineveh. He essentially went the opposite way that God asked him to go. 
And in doing so, God orchestrated events like a storm and a great fish to get him back on track to go in the right direction. And while inside, yes, inside the mouth of the big fish, Jonah realized his error and he repented. And at the end of chapter 2, we find him spit out by that great fish onto land. And so now we enter into chapter 3 and chapter 4 with that as the backdrop. And I think for chapter 3, really, I just will say three things. Because really, there's three simple movements there. One, Jonah obeys God to preach to Nineveh. Two, the people of Nineveh receive his preaching and they repent. And third, God has mercy and shows love and compassion to the people of Nineveh and saves them. So now for chapter four, where we're going to spend most of our time today, well, all of the rest of our time. And let me give some context to where we're going to go. Now, as we've heard, the book of Jonah was written by Jonah himself after recounting the events. It wasn't written like other books where it was by somebody else. He wrote it, and so essentially it's an autobiography. And in doing so, we notice he doesn't stop at chapter 3. Now, chapter 3, if he had stopped there, I think he would be able to give himself a lot of credit because chapter 4 is really unflattering. So, spoiler alert. I mean, it doesn't really make sense why he would want to pen chapter 4 in light of chapters 1, 2, and 3. Because after chapter 3, we can look at Jonah and maybe say, you know what? He's gone from zero to hero. He's gone from being a villain to someone with a heart. And maybe even like, it's almost like a script from Hollywood or Bollywood that you could put to a musical. So why bother writing chapter 4, which is not very flattering to Jonah's legacy? Well, I'm going to take a cue from Paul's letter to Timothy, his second letter, and chapter 3, where Paul writes... All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. So Jonah actually writes chapter 4 because he's inspired by God. God moves him. And essentially, he has no choice but to tell the truth because God is a truth teller. And we see this all throughout scripture. It's full of unflattering truths about the characters that we find. Noah, he was found to be a righteous man by God, and so God chose him to help restart the earth after the flood. But soon after he restarts, he gets drunk. David, God says, is a man after his own heart. But when we look at David's life, we see elements of being an absentee father. He commits adultery and then murders the man of the wife he commits adultery with. We find in Jesus' line, ancestors, a lady who is a prostitute. And Peter, who preached the first sermon on the day of Pentecost, he's rebuked by another person for being, showing favoritism and really racism. And so the Bible is always true about its characters. And so here's a point of reflection. I wonder if for us today in the environment and the climate we're living in, this is informative as we're called to reconsider the legacies and truths about people, leaders, and institutions. I wonder if us as a church and us as individual Christians who read the Bible and see this honesty at display, in display all the time, have a special voice and a unique perspective into what we see in the world today, where we can see from our experience of Scripture to tell the whole truth about people's legacies. One doesn't just flatter for the sake of flattering, but it tells the truth. And so this fourth chapter of Jonah, it's actually like a monument 
with an inscription showing the whole truth of his life because God inspired Jonah to tell the truth about himself. But Paul doesn't stop there in chapter 3 of his second letter to Timothy. In addition to saying that all scripture is inspired by God to show us what's true, he goes on to say, all scripture makes us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what's right. And God uses it to prepare and to equip his people to do every good work. So Jonah chapter 4 also reminds us that we're works in progress. I mean, when I think of my Christian life, and I'm sure some of you can relate as well, you experience God at a point in time when you become saved. For me, that was 20 years ago. But I know since then, I have my ups and downs. I know the correction of God. I see him setting my wrongs and pointing me in the right direction. And so we have to realize that salvation or being a Christian and being saved, as we call it, happens in a point in time, but is also an ongoing process. We acknowledge our sin and we believe in the work of Jesus at a point in time. And we receive God's forgiveness because Jesus pays the penalty for our sins. And we receive the Holy Spirit and receive power over sin. But the presence of sin remains and we're drawn to it. And so our salvation is an ongoing process. It's a process where we realize what's wrong in our lives, where God corrects us, where he teaches us what's right, and he prepares and he equips us for good works. And so we may not be perfect in this life, but we strive moment by moment, day by day, week by week, month by month, as we submit and surrender our lives to God's correction, preparation, and equipping. And Jonah chapter 4 reminds us of this, as we'll see. And as we look at the details in Jonah chapter 4, we'll see a very interesting interaction in, I'd say, four movements where each movement has God's action and Jonah's reaction. And it repeats, and it repeats, and it repeats. And as we get into this, we'll spend most of our time in the second movement. But of course, let's start with the first. So now you need your Bibles. So movement one, I'll actually start in chapter three, the very last verse. Chap verse three, chapter 10. And look at also verses one to three of chapter four. So let's read. When God saw what they did, the Ninevites, and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Chapter 4, verse 1. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. He ran the other way. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Not very flattering. God shows love, compassion, and mercy to the people of Nineveh. And Jonah, he gets very angry. Or in the words of my West Indian parents, he was vexed. So movement two. God questions Jonah's behavior. And Jonah moves away. Let's read verses four and five. But the Lord replied, have you a right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. 
There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. So God asked the first of three questions that he asked Jonah. And of course we know God doesn't ask questions to get answers that will give him information he doesn't know. He's all-knowing. He asks questions so that we can gain answers about ourselves. So we can know what he already knows. And we see this in the very first question that God asks in chapter 3 of Genesis. He says to Adam, where are you? It's not that God didn't know his physical location, although Adam was hiding. But God intended that this question would make it super clear to Adam that in disobeying him by eating of the tree of the fruit of good and evil, that he was being disobedient And this changed his proximity to God. That his spiritual connection to God was now broken. So God asks questions so we can learn about ourselves. So what was God trying to get Jonah to learn? God could have said to Jonah, you know what? You're angry, you're frustrated, I'm not even going to answer your prayer to me. Or he could have said, you know, you preached a great message. A whole city has now been saved. Go relax. Or he could have said, you know, I got other prophets to send to other cities. I don't really have time for you now. Just, you know, stop your complaining. I'll call you for your next assignment. Or maybe God could even confirm Jonah's suspicion that he was a lost cause and no longer useful to God and obliged his request to die. But that's not the God Jonah was interacting with. And that's not the God we serve. God is questioning Jonah to correct him, to show him what's wrong in his life, to teach him what's right. And to prepare him to continue to be involved in his work. And I think something else is at play here that is very relevant for us today too. Which is, God intended Jonah, who was carrying the gospel, to also be transformed by it. Because if that's not the case, and not the case with us, instead of helping we harm. Instead of bringing peace, we bring pain. And instead of bringing freedom with the gospel, we bring oppression. And when we think of the historical legacies of things that we see even in our day and time, where the gospel was given, but it didn't transform at all times those that gave it, it doesn't turn out well. Colonialism, or even the church in Canada, as we heard earlier, its involvement in the residential school system, with the indigenous peoples. So here's a point of reflection. How is God questioning us today? How is he questioning you? For Jonah, it was in a response to prayer. Is it a response to your prayers about some behavior in your life or something you've witnessed? Is it through people? Is it through his word? Is it through circumstances? What behavior of ours towards people is God questioning today? And are there roots of beliefs and blind spots and biases that are causing this behavior that he's trying to correct with his questioning? Who and where are the people that we behave towards in a way that he's caused to question us? Are these people in our homes? Are they in our neighborhoods? Are they in neighborhoods that we choose not to go to? Are they in our work? Are they in our schools? Are they in our churches? So God questions Jonah to correct 
his behavior and the roots of beliefs and blind spots and biases. So how did Jordan respond? Well, we read, he leaves Nineveh by going east outside the city. He builds a temporary shelter, probably something that he would learn to do in the, like for the Feast of Tabernacles. And he waits to see what happens next. I actually have an active debate in my own self, in my mind, as to what was Jonah doing here. Did he need a quiet space to engage and ponder God's question? I know moving out of an environment often helps me when I'm frustrated or angry or upset. And maybe waiting to see what would happen to the city as he writes is a form of engagement with God's question. Or did he just disengage with the God of the question? I'll be honest with you this morning, I'm leaning towards he was disengaged. I think this because he's had a history of disengaging from God. His anger is really deeply rooted based on the words that are used here. He was greatly displeased. He, in fact, told God he didn't want to be involved in this from the beginning. <laughs> and maybe I probably think he might have had somewhere to stay in Nineveh when he was preaching. I'm not sure he did it all in one day. And if that's the case, he maybe already had somewhere to stay. So why did he have to leave? And he actually doesn't write he was pondering the question. He writes he's waiting to see what happens. So I think he was disengaged. But what if he had engaged? What if he had stayed in the city where God was at work and loving the people and didn't let his discomfort cause him to disengage? Would he have learned how to love the Ninevites like God did? Would he have realized that just as he was a work in process, that the Ninevites were too and they would join together to learn and grow in God? Would he have introduced them to aspects of God's character that he knew as an Israelite that they hadn't yet learned, like justice and compassion? Would he have gone back to his friends in Israel and said, you won't believe what happened. The pagans in Nineveh turned to our God. They believed. And maybe some of them would have gone back. So the question for reflection for us today is, are we making space to engage and listen to God's questions? In prayer, through his word, through people, through circumstances. Movement three, in verses six to nine. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry at this vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. Hmm. So God is relentless in his pursuit of Jonah and getting him to correct his behavior and the roots of his beliefs and blind spots and biases. But Jonah remains resistant. God acts quickly with urgency. He doesn't let Jonah stay in his feelings too long. 
And he orchestrates a series of events curated just for Jonah in those moments that only God could do to further push him to see his incorrect beliefs, blind spots, and biases. He prepares a plant to shade Jonah. His own shelter that he built was just insufficient. Isn't that the case all the time? God has to provide what we really need. He provides a worm to then chew through the leaf so that when the sun rises, which God provides in a way, it causes Jonah to realize how hot it is. These situations could only be done by God and provided by God. And I wonder, are there circumstances and situations like that in our lives? And I have to be honest, I wonder if COVID is one of them. We've all experienced it differently. But there's been some things that have been highlighted to us collectively. Things like the inequalities that our world has seen or been experiencing that COVID just unearthed or made laid bare. The widening gap of haves and have-nots. The injustices that have been going on for centuries, but COVID just made it more obvious to us, it seems. Things, injustices rooted in anti-Asian, anti-black, and anti-indigenous racism. The plight of our environment, it's always been there. But COVID reminded us as we drove less, as we flew less, as we manufactured less, as we shipped less, that we have a great impact on this world. So a point of reflection. In his love, what is God orchestrating and curating for the people's church? For you, for me, in order to get our attention to the correction and the setting right and the preparing and the equipping he wants to do with us. What is he doing specifically for us, for you? And at the end we see Jonah stubbornly and as I said resistantly to God's constant attempts, his relentless attempts to work with Jonah, he stays angry. He's moved from being angry at God's ways with the people of Nineveh and the people of Nineveh to now angry at the lack of protection from this vine. So the fourth movement, and we'll be closing here, chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, Though you did not tend to it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? So God drops the mic but there's no response from Jonah. God tells Jonah in the plainest of language that he has an issue with loving the people that God loves the way he does. I'm reminded of the words from the Lausanne Covenant that say, the mission of God flows from the love of God. The mission of God's people flows from our love of God and for all that God loves. And so although Jonah doesn't respond, and I said the movements were God's action and Jonah's reaction, at the end, we don't have an explicit action or reaction from Jonah. 
I tend to believe that him penning this autobiography was a way for him to actually confess that God was working with him and he didn't see it. That God was trying to correct his behavior, adjust his blind spots, his beliefs, and his biases towards the people that he was called to. And he reminds us in this truth that God may be questioning us as well. And so this doesn't have to be our story where we don't respond. Will we say yes to God's questioning of our behavior and its roots in our beliefs, blind spots, and biases? Will we say yes to his love and relentless pursuit of us in creating events just for us to see where he's at work? Will we say yes and recognize the questions and create space to engage with God through prayer, in his word, with others? And that's my prayer for us and for myself this morning, that we would say yes to God's questioning and we would engage with him in this way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the fact that you're a truth teller. The fact that in your truth telling, your desire is to correct us, to show us where we're wrong and set us on the right path and to prepare and equip us for your good work. Your good work, which is rooted in loving others, and being transformed by the message of love and gospel that we bring. So help us that to that to be true about us. Help us to surrender and lean into you in this way, Lord, today and always. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Andre, thank you so much for that message church i mentioned in the first message in this series that it was a year ago that i felt god leading us into the book of jonah right after dna and little did i know that at that time uh, that canada would be experiencing its own nineveh like moment uh, i looked at social media on canada day and i saw a nation wrestling with its own legacy with its own history and and just the timeless principles that are contained in the book of Jonah when nationalism and, and racism and uh, implicit bias get wrapped up with the people of God and, and the gospel's calling us to something different. God's heart is calling us to something different. And I trust that through today's message, you will continue to explore ways in which we have Jonah-like tendencies in our own lives, in how we view or perceive the world around us or others around us. Continue to pray and work through that book, through this message, as it plays out in our day and age, seeing people repent of the history of our own nation and how it got established. Well, church, next week we're going to be diving into a new series, one that is timely for a, a church and a culture that's coming out of a pandemic. We're going to be heading into a series entitled iGen Faith and Technology. We're going to be looking at a theological framework of innovation and technology throughout the scriptures, but also the opportunity that technology provides and also some of the obstacles in our walk with God. The importance of establishing healthy spiritual disciplines in a digital age, and of course, parents out there, uh, some useful tools uh, will be presented in a few weeks as a part of this series to help you navigate parenting in a digital age, especially in the midst of a pandemic. So I'm excited for what we're heading into God bless you, church. Thank you for being with us this morning. And let's give our attention now to Camillo as he closes our time together. God bless you, church. Thanks for worshiping with us today, church. It's so great to learn 
grow and encourage one another each week. Church, don't forget that our virtual church lobby will stay open for the next 30 minutes for you to connect, engage, and pray with our pastoral staff this morning. To study today's message throughout the week, you can use our study questions in the video description below. If you like to study in a group setting, we encourage you to join one of our online life groups. Our life groups are where we get together in a smaller group during the week to encourage one another and grow together in our faith journey. You can learn more and sign up by visiting our website, thepeopleschurch.ca. Our new online discipleship course selections for this season are also now available on our website and we encourage you to take a look and see how you can join in and continue to deepen your faith with one another this summer. Have a great week, church.